South believes the right partnerships and the right customer offerings will make the difference as interactive services are developed and deployed. This is Ken Pyle and we're in the exhibit floor. Uh, actually the exhibits are closed right now, but we're at the Broadband Community Summit 2013. We're with uh, William Stickler of Primetime Cable, but f rewind, what, 28 years ago or so, 27 years ago, and you were involved in the, the world's first fiber to home project. Why don't you tell us a little bit about right. that? In 1986, uh, Bell South uh, got together with GenStar Properties in Orlando, Florida at Hunters Creek. I worked on behalf of the developer and uh, we put together the world's first fiber optic cable system. I worked with Bell Labs and wrote the specs and, uh, and some of those guys that I worked with went on with, to Wave 7. Okay, well, it was Jim Farmer, was he one yeah, of them? Yeah, yeah, he was one of them. Yeah. So it was kind of an unusual when I look back on the fiber system we have, uh, it was fully addressable, we had tiering, it was tied into the billing system, and we actually developed at Hunters Creek um, and VOD, and VOD with um, Motorola, Gerald at the time. Yeah. The system works like this. The process starts at the head end, where Hunters Creek Cablevision receives major network, cable station, and premium channel programming from a satellite receiver dish. This programming is then encoded into digital form at the cable office, which allows it to be further converted into optical signals. From there, a fiber optic feeder cable runs to a buried controlled environmental vault, or CEV, which contains equipment that performs the local distribution of the signals. From the CEV, two fibers are routed to each customer's home. They terminate in a box called an optical network interface, or ONI. Usually located in the customer's garage, the ONI translates the optical signal to an electrical signal, which is then transmitted over two coaxial cables to an outlet on the wall of the customer's home. This means that two programs can be delivered to the home at one time, but the number of TV sets connected to the system is not limited. Coaxial cables connect the channel selection unit to these two ports. This converter box is distributed by the cable company to customers and works only with a fiber optic system. Customers can then choose channels with a remote control convenience of this handheld controller. The request is then sent back through the ONI and over standard telephone wires to the CEV, where dedicated channel cards authorize the actual transmission of the particular programming subscribed to by the customer. We also had grooves from China come over, uh, Japan, we had two conferences with Japan, and actually from our uh, conferences that we have for the Japanese, they took that technology and went back over to Japan and became the world's leading country for fiber optic TV. You, you actually developed some applications to kind of go with it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what we did is we got with uh, Florida Power and they would actually read their power meter from St. Pete over our, over our system. Okay. So they didn't have to send somebody out to, yeah. uh, to read the meters. So it was really neat. Uh, I, was, uh, I look at it that I was very fortunate to be in the right place and probably thousands of the guys that are attending the show, they could do the same that I did but I was just in the right place at the right time. Well, it's interesting. It had a kind of a flashback to a multi-mode fiber in those days and thinking how that fiber, you know, you say it's going to be in the ground for 50 years. Well, I don't think that some of the fiber I was involved with in those days is still in the ground. Was that multi-mode fiber? Was it single-mode fiber? Well, it's kind of un unique technology. There was actually one fiber that would go to an underground vault for each channel. Then there was a control card inside that underground vault. So we could do tiering. We could give people their HBO service levels. We could do pay-per-view. There's actually one fiber would have one channel. Uh, I gave Bell South the specs. This is what I wanted, fully right. addressable. And they, Bell Labs did it. Yeah. And that was really fascinating. And that's where every, these shows and everything else actually comes from those days. How, do you recall how many subscribers in the end that were on it? Well, we had uh, in the fiber to the... Um, Fiber to the Home, the original one was 300, okay. and, that, and they were actually retrofitted out of Hoffman boxes. And when Bell South came down to activate it, they actually had, had to make modifications on site to make sure everything worked. And then Hunters Creek developed Fiber to the Home, but then when I found the limitations as a cable operator, that's where Fiber to the Curb came about. Okay. And Bell South and Bell Labs developed that technology for me. So that's really what for the most part, what, what we're using today. 
because it just runs it from one point to another. There was no tearing or anything like that. But the first one, first fiber system in 86 was really slick and there's really nothing like it today. That, that's amazing and it's, um, uh, it's something that um, it can get kind of lost in the shuffle of everything that's going on here, but it, it is a very important historical uh, piece. Well, if, if you take a look at where we started, fully addressable, tiering, mm -hmm. Uh, pay-per-view capabilities and now do, do we have that? I don't really think we do. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of like take a look from the cable operation side of things. What should this technology really strive for? And I think tiering, getting into billing, you know, attaching it to billing, uh, so you cut down on truck rolls and all those other things, then I think that, um, you know, back then we, we really did do a lot. I assume you, you also are involved in cable operations today, right, with right. primetime cable. Are, are you guys moving to fiber to the home? Yeah, we're doing that at apartments outside of Disney. Okay. So we are uh, getting back into that, into that arena, but you got to look at it this way. Back in 86, you had really unlimited pockets when you had Southern Bell yeah. and you had Bell Labs. So money really wasn't a problem. And Dick Snelling was the head of Southern Bell at the time, yeah. and he had a vision. Uh, he was a visionary. In a recent interview, Southern Bell Vice President of Network, Dick Snelling, touched on the importance of this new project. Southern Bell is involved in this project because it's fundamental to our long-term plans to uh, develop a full array of communications uh, capability for our customers, residents and business, uh, both now and through the end of the decade and likewise on through the end of the century. There are a lot of things going on in the industry uh, which would lead us to believe that, uh, that where we need to be is at the living unit and with the widest uh, bandwidth possible that's commercially feasible. And so our rollout at uh, Hunter's Creek is fundamental to that long-term strategy. He had Dick Snelling that was really a visionary, like I say. He had the um, insight and he had the, uh, he made a change. And he's, what he saw 30 years ago or 25 years ago is happening today. Yeah. And it's great seeing everybody here because back in my day, I was the only one who was doing it. <laughs> but it's good to see people who are involved and in trying to take care of people's uh, needs and serve the people. Well, William, I appreciate you coming down here and, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing some of those images. Okay, man. Thank you.